My dear brothers and sisters, I bring you grace and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you were here last week, you heard Pastor Matheson share uh, what I would call a little inside baseball about uh, her sermon preparation last week, and she mentioned there was something in the gospel that try as she might, try to avoid it, uh, she kept coming back to it. It was sort of the center of gravity, and she ended up feeling obligated to preach about it. It was the story of an exorcism. Uh, In the same way this week, uh, something has happened here that I really feel like I need to uh, talk about and put in some context. And uh, it turns out it's not one of the Bible passages, although we had some good options. The uh, psalm uh, this morning we just heard uh, has the line, God heals the brokenhearted, which I thought would have been very appropriate given the Vikings' last game. (laughs) Thank you. Uh, this is true, by the way. The, the Old Testament reading, Isaiah, is a very famous reading that concludes with that famous line about uh, we will rise up like wings on eagles, which I felt it would be appropriate to avoid. Um, the gospel actually continues the story of Jesus healing, and, and there's a lot of rich material there, but uh, we'll, we'll come back to that another time. Because what I want to talk about, actually, is the installation of a brand new permanent piece of art here in our sanctuary. Some of you have maybe noticed it when you came in this morning. It's in the southeast corner. Uh, Some of you may not be able to see it based on where you're sitting, but I'd encourage you to take a look at it um, when you leave. And I want to put it was sort of, it, we've been working on this sort of conceptually for the last few years and in earnest over the last year. It just so happened that the artist completed it and was able to install it this week. And again, I sort of feel like I need to put it in some kind of context. Uh, part of which, by the way, is an ongoing or continuing tradition here of having original, beautiful, elegant pieces of art as part of our, our church uh, home. We had a meeting recently with an architect who we've worked with uh, on developing country projects we've done, and we're having some preliminary conversations with him about uh, work we want to do in Haiti over the next three to six years. Uh, We had that meeting a couple weeks ago, and he was here early, and he was wandering around the church, and the first thing he said to me before the meeting was, man, you guys have a lot of beautiful art here. And I think that's a good thing. Uh, He was talking about, for example, the wood carving in the atrium made by the same artist who made this. Uh, There's a a cross made of found materials also in the atrium. There's a painting of Jesus with the crown of thorns, which will move to the atrium, by the way. Now that we're beginning Lent, we have the icons of St. Philip the Deacon, all of our stained glass, the sculpture of St. Philip the Deacon. We have some more art downstairs in the Center for Faith and Life. And again, I'd like to believe this continues that tradition. And again, I think it's important in a congregation, in a church, um, to have beautiful things, right, uh, that remind us of the goodness and truth and beauty of the God we worship, and I hope that all of those pieces of art, including this new one, help us to do that. So the story behind this, though, goes back a few years. Um, the pastors for a while now have been talking and thinking about how do we make prayer a more important part of our life together. And so a number of years ago, some of you may remember this, we made a shift to our Monday night service, uh, and once a month uh, we had an opportunity to come for that Monday evening service that was mostly just listening. This was emphasizing the listening part of prayer, so it was a prayer in silence. Did anyone ever attend that service, by the way? Some of you? Okay. It was a beautiful, beautiful service. Um, After a few years, we sort of decided it had run its course, um, and we went back to our usual pattern of just a regular Monday night service, which, by the way, if you've not been to, I encourage you to go. it, It is a gorgeous service. But we incorporated into that some of the lessons we learned, like lighting candles, and leaving behind prayer requests, which uh, happens, again, every Monday night. The pastors pray over those prayer requests every week. Um, And as we were thinking about that, uh, it occurred to us that uh, it would sure be nice if we could figure out a way to incorporate that kind of response in an ongoing way um, throughout the week or during all of our services. And so while we were learning those lessons, we also were noticing um, some installations that encouraged prayer. This would have been at retirement homes in their chapels or hospitals in their chapels. And we started dreaming about what might work in this space to lift up and encourage prayer. And so we reached out to Tim Shea, that's the artist who did the carving in the atrium, and we started sort of dreaming about 
ways that we could encourage leaving prayers here. And this is the ultimate result of many iterations. Uh, it ended up being four panels with the cross uh, in the middle, uh, as well as a little desk uh, on that pillar in the corner to write prayers uh, and, a, and a receiver for those prayers in the south wall. So everyone is welcome to go there any time of the week, leave a prayer. You can leave it anonymously. You can leave the name. And, and we pastors will pray over it. Uh, during the week. Now, um, I'm going to come back to prayer in a second, but I also want to say something else about that corner of the sanctuary. While all this sort of discussion and dreaming about prayers was going on over the last few years, that corner um, has become, the word that comes to mind is a center of gravity uh, for what I will call the great cloud of witnesses, right? Those who have gone before us. And that has been particularly true during one month of the year, namely Advent, leading up to Christmas. Some of you may remember the last few years we've put a tree up there, which we've invited people to write uh, the names of those who have gone before us, who have died, loved ones, family members, friends, and hang them on the tree as ornaments. That has been a beautiful practice, and the tree has become filled with names. And by the way, we will continue to do that. This installation allows that tree to continue to be installed there. But I'd like to believe that this uh, permanent installation will create an ongoing uh, space for us to reflect on the great cloud of witnesses because of the words of the poem or the prayer, which I'll get to in a second. But it turns out that while we were dreaming about this project, one of our members, Karen Stewart, died. Um, Pat, her husband, who's here this morning and who gave me permission to talk about this, um, wanted very much to do something to sort of celebrate her life, to remember her, to honor her, and to say thank you to this community of faith. So Pat and I met, we talked about a, a variety of options, and, and this is now a reality thanks to Pat's um, generosity. So Pat, I want to say on behalf of the congregation, thank you uh, for your support. And for Pat, of course, that uh, installation is always going to be a deep and profound reminder of the, the wife he loved, of Karen. And that's appropriate and good and beautiful. But for those of you who have also lost someone, which is most of us, uh, I hope that that installation will be a place you can go also to remember those loved ones and to meditate on them and maybe to leave a prayer. Now back to this idea of prayers. Why is prayer so important? Um, I think, and again, we, the pastors have talked about this a lot and we're trying to encourage it more. Prayer is about an honest conversation with a God who loves us, right? Uh, it's about a relationship, a trusting relationship uh, where honesty is important. And this was driven home, I thought, in a really beautiful way this past Thursday at our Faith and Life event featuring Peter Enns. Did anyone go to that? I don't want to call you out or embarrass those who weren't there, but um, it was really good. You missed something. I think you can hear the podcast. Anyway, the talk was faith and certainty, and actually it was more of, uh, reminding us that certainty is not all that important in our life of faith, and doubt is okay. And again, it's about a trusting relationship with a God who loves us. And the most poignant story he shared that night for me was a story of his little boy, now grown, but he was five or six years old at the time, and Pete was reading to him the story of Adam and Eve and the serpent, and his son was kind of going, uh, uh. You know, clearly not following along in a way that was at all, you know, engaged. So Pete stopped and he just said, what's, what are you, what's going on? And, the, and his boy said, his son said, Dad, snakes can't talk. Now, Pete initially uh, wanted to respond in sort of a snarky way, but he was smart enough and wise enough to recognize that this was a real concern for his son and that his son was sort of going through a moment of crisis of faith, kind of. So very wisely, Pete, his father, said, you're having a problem with God right now, aren't you? And his son said, yes. And Pete said, simply, wisely, beautifully, <laughs> I'm not even going to comment on that. <laughs> but he says to his son, you're having a problem with God. The son says, yes. Pete says, tell him. Share that with God. Be honest with God. And so my prayer is that this place, and this is not the only place or the only opportunity to share our uh, feelings with God, but it's one place that reinforces how important it is to be honest. And I pray that, pray that that location now can be a place where we can also go to tell God what we are feeling, 
whether it's sadness or pain or despair or anger or frustration or joy or uh, confidence, anything. Uh, it's a reminder to engage in an honest relationship with a trusting God. Uh, I'm going to read the prayer. Uh, it's an ancient prayer. I'll actually try to find out where it comes from. It's been modified very slightly, um, and it's in your red hymnals. And you're, if you want to follow along, you're welcome to pull your red hymnals out. This is on page 68, uh, page number. So it's the early part of the, uh, the, the hymnal, not the page, no page numbers at the bottom of the pages in the front. So page 68. This is in a section about Thanksgiving uh, at the table, so it's connected to um, the meal that we share as a family, the meal of uh, communion. So page 68 under Roman numeral 9. And it's uh, the first three lines and then the final one. So let me read it quickly. Holy God, you alone are holy, you alone are God. The universe declares your praise. Beyond the stars, beneath the sea, within each cell, with every breath. That line is all about the presence of God in space, right? The universe, uh, beyond the stars, beneath the sea, is within every cell in our body. God is everywhere. Next one, generations bless your faithfulness. And generations... Uh, cues us to this one is about the presence of God through time. Generations bless your faithfulness through the water by night and day, across the wilderness, out of exile, into the future, right? God has been present even in difficult times, even in exile, even through the waters of the flood, uh, into the future. We give you thanks for your dear son at the heart of human life, near to those who suffer. And this is where I think that uh, critical mass or the center of gravity around those who are grieving is so important. Near to those who suffer, uh, beside the sinner, which is all of us, among the poor, and then the three most important words of the whole prayer, with us now, here, present among us. And then finally, the, the last um, couple of lines at the bottom of the page, blessing, praise, and thanks be to you, holy God, through Christ Jesus, by your spirit, in your church without end. And I pray that by being honest here in this place with one another and with the God who loves us, that people will sense that this is a place where God's presence is powerful. Where we, someone said once, uh, the church is a hospital for sinners. It is not a hotel for saints. And so I pray that we can come here and be honest, and one of the ways we can be honest is by leaving our prayers back there. And again, I invite you to take a look uh, at the beautiful installation after worship. Will you join me now in a word of prayer? Loving God, we thank you for being with us through time and space. And as we gather this morning, we pray that you will remind us of your deep love for us, no matter how we are feeling, and give us the courage every day to be honest with you, to respond to you uh, with our deepest feelings of grief or joy or pain so that you can remind us that you are present with us, which will allow us in turn to be present to others. In all this we pray in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs>